All right, Mark chapter 10, we're going to look at verses 17 all the way through 31. Anyone would be interested in reading tonight? You'll read. All right, do you want a microphone? Do we have a microphone? Yes, we want a microphone. A microphone. Phil Donahue is coming in just a minute with a microphone. I'm going to have to run upstairs. So count 20 Mississippi's. Let's see how fast Denny can get up there. You said 17 through what? 17 through 31. 17. Rich Run Ruler, Mark chapter 10. Okay. <laughs> As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. All right, thank you. All right, so um, I think there's a theme that we're going to look at, but I'll just kind of start with it and remind you of it. Um, you can make an idol out of anything. We all have to be cautious of this, that you can make an idol out of anything. There are things that are good that people make idols out of. For example, I'll give you this. Could you make... We've done this. Can, can you make children into idols? Oh, yes. Right, our society and times have made children into idols. You can take something. Is there anything inherently wrong with money? No. Is there anything wrong with being rich? No. No. There's, no, there's no biblical prohibition against being wealthy. Now, there's a, there is a warning by Paul to Timothy that the love of money is the root of all evil, okay? I've taken that phrase through the years and changed it to expectations are the root of all conflict. <laughs> You'll understand. So there's nothing wrong with, with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with money. But there is something wrong with loving money. And um, that's that, that passage, that, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, that really, I've, I've told you probably, I was, uh, my call to ministry happen on Highway 167 driving south from Troy back to Enterprise after going to, uh, to class one day. And I was reading the Bible in the truck. I'm really bad about reading and driving. And um, it makes texting and driving super easy. <laughs> so I was reading and driving. And, um, and I was re uh, the girl I was dating at the time left a Bible in my truck. It was a brown Bible. And I was reading 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
and it said, you've brought nothing into this world. You, you can't take anything out of it. And at the time, I was going to Troy. I was a business finance major. And I thought, like I've said, I was going to have a circle drive, two and a half kids, and the American dream. And um, yeah, that was times two. <laughs> and so, but that passage... The, root of, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And, the, and God really convicted me that day. And that was really my, my blinding call to ministry. Um, that nothing in this world was going to ultimately make me happy. And that I needed to pursue what God was calling me to. Not, um, not to riches and, and wealth and whatever else. And so... But there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There is something wrong scripturally with making an idol out of anything except the Lord. That our worship should be of him. So I've, I've written down a few thoughts about this passage that I'll share with you. And um, we might have somebody, actually somebody ought to take and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Put their finger there, Exodus 20. I'm going to have you read a few minutes. The Ten Commandments. Right? We forget what they say sometimes, I think. But here's what I'd say to you tonight. First thing is this. He got the horizontal commandments right, but he failed in the vertical ones. Because possessions were his idols. So he says, right? What does he say? Uh, when we think about the Ten Commandments, we think about, we separate them normally in sins against God and sins against brothers, neighbors. So somebody read, would somebody read Exodus 20, 1 through 17? Should be very familiar. Go for it. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou, thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, or thy neighbor's wife, or manservant, or maidservant, or his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor. All right, great. So. If you take these commandments, these 10 commandments from the Lord, and you were to break them up, there's four of them that deal with God. You uh, know God's before him, um, no image to worship in his likeness. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And then remember the, the Sabbath. The other six deal with how we re respond to humans, how we respond with our Family, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, right? Um, starting with honoring father and mother. And we have horizontal commandments, vertical and horizontal. So he gets the, doesn't he get all of the horizontal ones right? I mean, he, he says, I've kept all these things from my youth. Since, since the beginning, he's saying to Jesus, I've done all of these things. I, I haven't committed murder, committed adultery, false witness. And Jesus says, that's not enough. You've kept the horizontal ones, but you failed in the vertical ones. And here's how you failed in the vertical ones. Because your possessions, your money, your wealth, your whatever. You can just take, take the rich young ruler and replace it with any idol. And God is saying, because you value X, 
more than me, you're never going to get there. Your heart is in the wrong place. And again, we, we take lots of things and make idols out of them. We make idols out of people, right? Do we have idols in our society? We have idols. We have people that we, we look up to and we, well, well, what did they say? What did they say about that? Um, again, our children, often our marriages, certainly our possessions, our wealth, um, our degrees, whatever the case may be. Uh, we, we, we elevate these things above the Lord. And I would be very cautious to you that want, for a moment, wonder what your idols are. Wonder what your idols are. I'd say um, our sports idols. No, not, not idols in sports. Sports, right? We put so many other things ahead of meeting with the body of Christ and those kind of things. And... Um, we have to be real careful about these things. So, so that's the first thing. Just understand he got the horizontal commandments right, but he failed in the vertical ones because his possessions were his idols. And um, we all need to be called out about our idols. We really do. We need to be called out by the Holy Spirit about things we're putting in place in head of, ahead of the Lord. So here's the second thing. Jesus reminds us that salvation is impossible with man, but with God... It's possible. Now, interesting thing. This is one of those verses. We come across them a little bit uh, so all, every so often, and I'll try to remind you of them. Uh, they are verses that we historically have just ripped out of context. And, uh, and, and here it is. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, verse 26, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? Jesus says, or the man says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So we quote that all the time. We put it on coffee cups. We Instagram it, right? We, face, we Facebook it. We share it with the world. Well, the context of that verse is specifically talking about salvation. It's specifically talking about how can one be saved? And I, I think we've got to remember there, there are two aspects of this tonight. One is the means, just a reminder, there's nothing any human could do to save you. That's part of what I think Jesus is talking about. That if you said, I want to save myself, I'll pay for my own sins. You're not sinless. You're not spotless. You're not blameless. It would be impossible for you to pay for your own sins. So I think some of what Jesus is saying is it's impossible for you to redeem yourself. This isn't something you can accomplish. Your blood wasn't sufficient. A cross you would have been crucified on isn't sufficient. And so he's reminding us of the means, which is the cross of Christ. He's also reminding us of the method. And what's the method of salvation? Grace. Everyone in here was saved by the grace of God and nothing else. You weren't good enough. You didn't have enough merit. God didn't need you on his team. That's what we think. Well, what Man, God's lucky. I don't like the word luck. God's lucky. That's what people say. Man, I'm, I'm on. He, he picked me to be on his team. He probably couldn't do all this stuff without me. No. It's impossible Salvation is impossible apart from God and his work and his grace. What does that mean? It means we didn't save ourselves. We didn't save ourselves. That God sovereignly worked in our lives, redeemed us, stirred us. Certainly we responded. We embraced Jesus. I made a decision that night at a judgment house in Dothan, Alabama, to follow Christ. And so we need to be reminded, though, that salvation, apart from Jesus, and apart from the grace of God, and apart from him working in our life, is impossible. Impossible. No one can save themselves. And we should, uh, we should, sing, <laughs> we should sing that song fairly loudly, Amazing Grace. Amen. Right? Because we were just wretched sinners that needed 
genuine salvation and it came from, from Christ. And so we can be grateful for that. And then there's this reminder that the earthly family will be replaced and enhanced by the kingdom family. I would imagine most of you like your families. Most of you like your families. Some of you don't like your families, right? Some of you are dreading Thanksgiving. Some of you were hoping that COVID would last long enough to keep them away. <laughs> Somebody's thinking it though, I know. All right, but here's what Jesus says something about our families. And he talks about us leaving our earthly family and the reward we get from that. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution in the age to come eternal life. Jesus is saying we're going to be part of a new family, certainly in heaven. Certainly, you're going to meet brothers and sisters you, you didn't even know you had when you get to heaven. But it also, he's speaking of the fact that something's happened here. That we have been given a new family. We've been given new brothers and new sisters. We are part of the family of God, right? Uh, I can remember my home church. Um, that, that, that was kind of the end of the sermon, end of the service every day. They would, uh, and they would often hold hands and, and uh, reach across the pews and, and they would sing the family of God. And the idea was, this is my family. And uh, we should be reminded that this is a genuine family, more than a church. This is a family of God, a household of faith. It's referred to in the Bible that we are part of something that is living the body of Christ. And you may have um, you may have left your family for Jesus. Do you know there are people there are people in this world that have had to do that? Right. They've come to know Jesus and especially in some Muslim dominated countries have had to make that decision. Am I going to leave this family and live my faith? Um, we, we, maybe we can get a, our friend that we bought our home from in Atlanta from her, Sarah. And she's in a pretty dangerous country. But uh, when she came to speak, she came and she shared about people who had come to know Christ in the country she's working in. And ultimately, because of the potential of death, had to leave. Uh, some fled the country. Some fled to other parts of the country. And um, imagine if that was your case. If you were raised in a family that was hostile to the gospel. And when you came to know Jesus, they said, oh, you're going to follow Christ? Well, you're not going to do it in my house. Get out. Go find your own place to live. Well, Jesus says, if that's, if that's what happens to you, you're going to gain, you're going to gain, he says, hundredfold families, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and lands with persecution in the age to come, and in eternal life. There's an, there's an even better family waiting, if you will, for us. And then lastly, I would just say, uh, he, he gives one of these uh, proverbial statements. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Well, again, the theme of Mark, Mark chapter 10, 40, verse 45, says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, here's another verse that sort of amplifies that. He's saying the many who are first, the many who think I'm here to be served, this is all about me. This is all about um, you all catering to, to this need or that need. He says the, the person that's unwilling to be a servant of all is going to be last. And the last first, the person who says, no, I'm, I'm a servant of the body of Christ. I've been called to serve. That we're, as believers, been called to serve. The, uh, the Lord implies that um, there's going to be something that, that is uh, maybe a little richer for us. Richer, get it? You'll get it on the ride home. <laughs> Go and watch the video. You'll appreciate it more. There's something about eternal life that might be a bit richer. 
the, maybe the, the blessing we receive in some form. And so, but I, I think it's a strong encouragement to, uh, to be a service-oriented person, to serve the people of the church and to, um, and to serve in a way that is honoring to God. So, all right, so there's a few thoughts for you tonight.